coming up next on NMZ Live TV. You would have gone through in 2018. God knew what you would have gone through in 2021. And God knows what you're going through even now. Nothing catches him by surprise. Up next on NMZ Live TV. The psalmist says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to join together, to worship together, to come together to praise our awesome God. And today we at the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, we are thankful that you are worshiping here with us. Even though it's virtually, we bless God that you are here. The New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church is located on Blue Hill Road, just south of Cowpen Road on the beautiful island of New Providence in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Our senior pastor is Pastor Alfred Stewart, and I am Pastor Theophilus Claridge, pastor of the children's ministry here at the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. There are those of you who are worshiping with us today. You might be a member of the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, but you cannot come out for whatever reason. You might be a follower, or you might be a visitor to the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. And you would like to reach out to us, whether it's to make a donation or for spiritual counseling. Here's how you can contact us. Our telephone number is 1-242-3441. One eight zero four. That's one two four two three four one eighteen zero four. Or you may send us a WhatsApp at one two four two three four one three seven two six. That's one two four two three four one thirty seven twenty six. And if you have not done so, we invite you to save the WhatsApp number to your phone so you can receive updates from the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. And just so you can be aware, the updates we will send is happenings at the church. This is not a group, but this is just a blast. So you are safe to know that you will only receive updates from the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. You can email us at new.mount.zion at gmail.com. That's new.mount.zion at gmail.com. And we invite you to like and to subscribe to our YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook pages. Or whatever social media page you're seeing us on, we just ask that you like or subscribe to those channels. There are those of you whose the ministry of the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church has been a blessing. And we ask that you share these videos with your family, friends, loved ones. Simply a backslash, the new Mount Zion. Backslash, the new Mount Zion. Today, we hear a profound message from the pastor of the women's ministry of the new Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, Pastor Sharice Evans, who will bring God's word for today. Just before Pastor Evans comes, we will hear from the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church praise team as they help us to prepare to receive God's message for today. Come on, lift your hands all over the building. Hallelujah. 
somebody give God some praise. Yeah. You alone, Jesus. You alone, Jesus. You alone, Jesus. You alone, Jesus. God, we magnify you. God, we lift you up. You are the glory and the lifter up of our heads. So we bless and adore you. Place no one before you. Worthy, 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 worthy Jesus. Worthy, worthy, worthy Lord. Come on, somebody worship him. Worthy, worthy, I praise him. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lamb of God. You worthy, you worthy, you worthy Jesus. We give you glory, Jesus. We give you glory, Jesus. We give you glory, Lord. You are the earth, my praise, declare that he is great. Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22. And straightway, Jesus constrained the disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith. Wherefore didst thou doubt? I'm sure the Lord is able to add his richest blessing to the reading and the hearing of his most holy word.
Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we come before your presence. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you, Lord God, for allowing us to see another day. We thank you, O oh God, for another opportunity to declare your word. Father, we pray, God, that you would give us ears that we would hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. And not only ears to hear, but an obedient heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, she's not going to keep you long. Amen. As I sought the Lord for word, the Lord gave me the sentence. He says, stay focused. He said to me, Sharice, stay focused. And when I thought about this word, he brought the horse to me. He brought that particular animal, the horse. And I wondered why the Lord gave me the horse. And as I began to research a little bit about the horse, I realize that a horse has a 350 degree vision. Say that to your neighbor. Tell your neighbor the horse has a vision of 350 degree. What I mean by that, that a horse has a 350 degree, for those mathematicians, those students in math, who, who know that a circle has, what, 360 degree, meaning I start here, and I end here at 360 degree. But the type of vision that a horse has, it's 350, meaning that if you were to take an imaginary line from the tip of the horse's nose all the way back to the tail of the horse, the horse can see all of this on this side, and he can see all of this on the other side. And that's a good thing for the horse because it allows the horse to see a predator that's coming to attack it. But it could be a bad thing for those horses that are race horse. It could be a bad thing for those horse that have to pull a, car, a cart. You know down Bay Street we see the horse drawn buggy, right? So for those type of horse, that could be a bad thing. And what the owners of the horse would do, they would place blinders on the sides of the horse's eyes. They would place blinders. Remember, the horse has the type of vision that allows him to see all of this and all of this. So in order for the horse to go straight ahead and not to get distracted by what's happening around them, the owner would place blinders on the horse's head. And the, God, and the Lord said to me, tell my people, that they need to stay focused. They need to wear their blinders. Ask your neighbor, are you wearing your blinders? You see, because all around the horse, there are distractions. And that's dangerous. Because if the horse gets distracted, 
it can cause an accident. It could cause the horse to hurt himself. It could cause the horse to hurt the rider or even the people that's, uh, that's on the buggy. Similarly, the believer is inundated by distractions. This is one of the enemy's weapons of mass destruction, which is bringing him much success because he's getting believers to remove their focus of Jesus Christ. And as a result, they find themselves like Peter, sinking in the sea of life. So this morning for the allotted period of time, I wish to speak from the topic. When you take your focus of God or when you take your focus of Jesus Christ. And I see some of you looking at me strangely and saying, Sister Evans, for a teacher, you know that's not a sentence. You know that's not a complete thought. That's a fragment. It cannot stand on its own. It's a dependent clause. So it needs an independent clause to attach it to self so that you can get the full understanding of what I'm saying. So as we continue in this message, I'm going to give you some clarity of what happens when you take your eyes of Jesus. When you remove your focus of God. From the text that was read in Matthew chapter 14, we find the story of Peter walking on the water. In the text, we see Jesus walking on the sea during the night. But at first, the disciples thought they were seeing a ghost and became fearful. Jesus then spoke to them and told them not to be afraid because it was him and not a ghost. Peter answered in verse 28, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. The literal standard version says it this way, but seeing the wind vehement, he was afraid. And having begun to sink, he cried out saying, Sir, save me. So based on this verse, I can infer that Peter removed his focus of Jesus. He lost track on what he asked Jesus to do and the command Jesus had given him, which was to come. Peter took his eyes or removed his focus of Jesus for what I believe was a split second. And something happened. Peter began to sink. But when I thought about it, I realized that the devil doesn't need you to take your focus of Jesus for 10 minutes or an hour for him to move in and do whatever he wants. You are constantly being monitored by the devil. Tell your neighbor, you're constantly being monitored by the devil. Because he is not omnipresent or everywhere at the same time, he has demonic spirits assigned to your life to monitor and study your every move. And because of this, you are on watch 24-7. He waits for the opportune time to move in with his distraction to get you to lose focus by taking your eyes of Jesus. I believe that immediately after Peter took his eyes of Jesus and began paying attention to the wind and the wave, he began to sink. Tell your neighbor things happen when you take your eyes of Jesus. And for a few minutes, I want to lift up a few points from our topic. Firstly, when you take your eyes of Jesus or you remove your focus of God, it causes you to move out of position. Look at your neighbor and say, it causes you to move out of position. The grass will appear greener on the other side. And notice I said, will appear greener on the other side. In the book of Ruth, 
we find the story of Elimelech and his family who lived in Bethlehem, Judah. Ruth chapter 1, starting at verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Tell your neighbor there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of the wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left, and her two sons died. Now they took, now they took wives of the women of Moab. Let me read that again. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left. And her two sons, now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Let's pause and examine this passage a little bit more closely. Elimelech lived in Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem means the house of bread. And Judah means thanksgiving or praise. The Bible says they were Ephrathites of Bethlehem. The word Ephrath in Hebrew means fruitful. The Bible says there was a famine. Doesn't that seem contrary? You may be wondering how could a fruitful people dwelling in the house of bread be experiencing a famine. The famine was not a permanent situation. Tell your neighbor, it was a temporary destruction. This is how the devil works sometimes in the life of the believer, to move them out of position. Sometimes he shows up, whether it's on your job, or in your marriage, or in your family, to frustrate you and to cause you to move out of position. His one goal is to get you to remove your focus of God and to allow a temporary destruction to cause you to make a permanent decision, and that is to move out of position. How do you know that you have removed your focus of God on the job? Well, you find yourself making phone calls and filling out applications trying to find a new job. That's how you know when you've removed your focus from of God on the job. How do you know that you've removed your focus of God in your marriage? You begin speaking to other persons about their, the process of divorce. How do you go about this? What do you do? You have made an appointment to see the divorce lawyer. That's when you know you remove your focus of God in your marriage. Tell your neighbor, keep focus. Keep your blinders on. The famine in Bethlehem, the house of bread, is just temporary. Tell your neighbor that the famine that you're going through in your life is just temporary. God calls you fruitful. You are in the house of bread. Don't get distracted by the temporary famine that you're going through. Unfortunately, unfortunately for Lamelech and his family, he moved from the house of bread to a heathen country called Moab, which means, who is your father? Lamelech was in the house of bread, where he was in covenant with God the Father, who would sustain him and his family. But because of a temporary distraction, a famine, 
He moved from the house of bread where he was in covenant with God the Father to a land where there was no covenant with God the Father, a place where the question was asked, who is your father? Who is your father? The Bible tells us that in 10 years, both Elimelech and both of his sons died, leaving behind their widows. So we see that when you lose focus on God, or when you remove yourself or your focus off of God, it causes you to move out of position. Secondly, when you take your eyes of Jesus, or you remove your focus of God, you begin speaking what is contrary to the word of God. Tell your neighbor, when you lose focus, when you take your eyes of God, you begin speaking what is contrary to the word of God. Any witnesses in the house? You begin speaking the opposite of what God said. God says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. God says you are the head and not the tail. God says you are above and not beneath. But I don't know if I could do that. I, I don't know. I just don't know. In the book of Numbers chapter 12, verse 26 through 33, we find the story of the 12 spies whom Moses sent out to the promised land. And this is the report they brought back, starting at verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite company at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the, Neg the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Caleb's focus was on who? God. But the man who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. You heard what they said? In our own eyes, the way we see ourselves is like grasshopper. That's how we see ourselves. And he says, not only do we see ourselves like grasshopper, they see us as grasshoppers. So they've already released that spirit of doubt and lack of confidence in the atmosphere. So we see that the ten, fly, the 10 spies placed their focus on themselves and the people they saw in the promised land. They spoke what was contrary to the word of God spoken to Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 15 and 21, which says, You, however, will go to your ancestors in, a, in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites had not yet reached its measure. When the sun had set and darkness has fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants, I give this land from the wadi of Egypt 
to the great river, the Euphrates, the lands of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephathites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gerbashites, and the Jebusites. And we know what happened as a result of the negative report. God caused the children of Israel to wander in the wilderness for another 40 years until that generation, that doubtful generation died out. When you take your focus of God and place it on yourself or somewhere else, you will come up with excuses as to why you can't do what God is calling you to do. When God called Moses or when he chose Moses to be the instrument that he would use to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt, Moses said in Exodus 4 and 10, Oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been. And I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. When God called Jeremiah to be a prophet, he responded by saying, Alas, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. When God called Gideon to deliver the Israelites from the Midianites, his focus was not on God. In Judges 6 and 15, Gideon said, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. I believe Jeremiah lost focus. On God, remember the devil doesn't need a whole hour to get you to begin speaking what is contrary to the word of God. He can take charge in a matter of seconds. Remember, it didn't take very long for Peter to lose focus. In Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 17 through 18, and I want to read what Jeremiah said. He said, oh Lord, you misled me and I allowed myself to be misled. You are stronger than I am, and you overpowered me. Now I am mocked every day. Everyone laughs at me. When I speak the word, burst out violence and destruction. I shout. So these messages from the Lord have made me a household joke. But if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak his name, his word burns in my heart like fire. It's like the fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. I have heard the many rumors about me. They call me the man who lives in terror. They threaten. If you say anything, we will report it. Even my old friends are watching me, waiting for a fatal slip. He will trap himself, they say. And then we will get our revenge on him. But the Lord stands beside me, a great warrior. Before him, my persecutors will stumble. They cannot defeat me. They will fail and be thoroughly humiliated. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. O oh Lord of heaven's army, you test those who are righteous and you examine the deepest thoughts and secrets. Let me see your vengeance against them. For I have committed my cause to you. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For, thou, for though I was poor and needy, he rescued me from my oppressors. Yet, after all of that praise, this is what Jeremiah says. Yet, I cursed the day I was born. May no one celebrate the day of my birth. I cursed the messenger who told my father. So in a split second, Jeremiah removed his focus of of God and what God was able to do. He says, may no one celebrate the day of my birth. I curse the messenger who told my father, good news, you have a son. Let him be destroyed like the cities of old. And the Lord overthrew without mercy. Terrify him all day long with battle shouts because he did not kill me at birth. Oh, that I had died in my mother's womb and her body had been my grave. Why was I ever born? My entire life has been filled with trouble, sorrow, and shame. Jeremiah began to speak what was contrary to God's word that he said to him in chapter one when he called him. God said, before I formed you in the womb, 
I knew you. Tell your neighbor, God knows you. God knows or he knew what you would have gone through in 2020. God knew what you would have gone through in 2019. God knew what you would have gone through in 2018. God knew what you would have gone through in 2021. And God knows what you're going through even now. Nothing catches him by surprise. He is the sovereign God. Tell your neighbor, nothing that happened to you in your life caught God by surprise. The pain, the hurt, the discomfort, the failed marriage, nothing caught God by surprise. He says the good thing about it, it doesn't matter how bad it was. It doesn't matter how bad it is. All things work together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. So the failed marriage worked according to God's purpose. God has a purpose in the midst of the divorce that happened to you. God has a purpose in the midst of you losing your job. Whatever bad thing happened to you, God says all things will work for your good. He said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Isn't that some assurance? Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth and said to him, I have put my words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over the nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Hallelujah. Thirdly, when we remove our focus of God or take our eyes of Jesus, it will cause your miracle to be short-lived or unfinished. Tell your neighbor's going to cause your miracle to be short-lived or unfinished. In verse 28 of our text, Peter made a request. And notice Peter didn't ask something of Jesus that he could have done himself. God isn't coming to do something that you can do for yourself. Tell your neighbor, God is not coming to do something that you can do for yourself. You know, many of us pray, Lord, help my neighbor. God says, you help them. I've given you the resources to help them. I've given you blessings so that you can be a blessing. <laughs> Ask your neighbor the question, what is it that you're asking God for? I don't think they heard you. Ask them again. What is it that you are asking God for? I want you to take the limit of God and ask him for the impossible. Ask him for the miraculous and ask him for what someone said was the ridiculous. Peter said, Lord, if it is really you, if it is really the one who I saw open blinded eyes, if it is really the one who I saw made the deaf to hear, if it's really the one who caused the lame to walk, if it's really the one who fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, if it's really the one who healed the sick, if it's really the one who raised the dead, bid me come. Peter asks for what was naturally impossible for man to do but wasn't impossible for God to do. So this request of Peter would have proven that Jesus was who he said he was. 
Peter said, I have witnessed you do the impossible with my own eyes. So if you are who you really claim to be, bid me to come. Then in verse 29, we see that Jesus answered Peter's request and commanded him to come. The Bible says, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Peter began to do the impossible. Look at your neighbor and say, Peter began to do the impossible. But as we continue to read the following verses, we see that the miracle was short-lived. Then here comes the word, but. The Bible says, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. This verse brings me to my fourth point. Fourthly, when you remove your focus of God, or you take your eyes of Jesus, the spirit of fear enters and the spirit of faith exits. Look at your neighbor and tell them that. The spirit of fear enters and the spirit of faith leaves. The Bible says, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Fear gripped Peter like it gripped the prophet Elijah. Fear doesn't care when it comes. Fear doesn't care when it comes. It will come when you are on the mountaintop. Tell your neighbor, it will come when you're in the valley. It will come when you least expect it. It will come after you've experienced a great victory. Elijah experienced this. God had just given Elijah great victory on Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal. And he had all of them killed. And when he got the message from Queen Jezebel, that the next day, I won't be queen if I don't do what you've done to my prophets. So in other words, she told, she sent a message to Elijah that she was going to kill him. And immediately, when Elijah heard the news, he forgot the power of God that showed up on Mount Carmel. He forgot how God burned up the, the sacrifice on the altar and moved. Immediately, the spirit of fear gripped Elijah. And the Bible says, Elijah wanted to die. He ran in the wilderness and he wanted to die. So not only did the spirit of fear grip Elijah, also came the spirit of depression. Also came the spirit of discouragement. Also that came to try to attach itself with the spirit of suicide. I want you to know that the spirits don't work in isolation. Tell your neighbor the spirits don't work in isolation. They work in tandem. Even the employees of Satan know how to network. You think only us know how to network, eh? Well, the spirit of fear knew how to network with the spirit of discouragement. And the spirit of discouragement knew how to network with the spirit of depression. So on and so forth. They work in tandem. They work together. Finally, when you take your eyes of Jesus or you remove your focus of God, you will begin to sink. Tell your neighbor, you will begin to sink. Verse 30 says, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. Notice the Bible didn't say sank, which is in the past tense. Or Peter had sunken, which is the past participle. It said beginning to sink. So to get a picture, just imagine Peter going down in the water, but his head or even his shoulders were not submerged at that point. As a believer, how do you know when you're sinking? As a believer, how do you know when you're sinking? Well, I'm glad you asked. Tell your neighbor, we are sinking 
when we start sinning and we no longer are convicted by the Holy Spirit, we are sinking. We are sinking when we go days or even weeks without praying. We are sinking. We are sinking when we read our Bibles every other day. And notice I said every other day and not every week. Because God admonishes us that we are to be in his word day and night. We are sinking when we no longer live a life of fasting. We are sinking when we neglect to spend that quality time to become intimate with God. We are sinking when we let the cares of this life take hold of our hearts and we begin to worry. We begin to sink. We are sinking when we walk around with bitterness, resentment, jealousy, hatred, and unforgiveness in our hearts. We are sinking when we gossip about our brothers and sisters. We are sinking when we are only hearers of the word of God and not doers of the word of God. We are sinking. But praise God, there is hope. Look at your neighbor and say, praise God, there is hope. The Bible says in verse 30, beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. Peter took his focus of the wind and the wave and he realized the state that he was in and he placed his focus back on Jesus. And he cried, Lord, save me. And the cry that Peter cried was one of desperation because Peter was probably about to drown. He was about to die, but he knew who could save him. He knew who could help him. Not the distraction, the wind and the wave. The waves could kill him, but he saw Jesus and he put his focus back on Jesus and he said, Lord, save me. And God is waiting to hear the cry from his people today. He is waiting for us to cry out to him because we are in a state of sinking. He is waiting for us to cry, Lord, save me. Your state may be a little bit different from mine. But we all need to cry out, Lord, save me. We all need to cry out, Lord, save me. You may be sinking in the sea of addiction. It may be addiction to alcoholism, addiction to drugs, addiction to pornography, addiction to perversion, addiction to gambling. Whatever the addiction is, God wants to save you today. Cry out to him like Peter did. God wants to give you the testimony like the songwriter who penned these words. He says, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply staying within, sinking ashaka to rise no more. Any witnesses in the house? Anybody found themselves in that situation? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, but the master off the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters, ah, Jesus, lifted me. Now safe am I. God wants to lift somebody in here today. God wants to lift you from out of your sinking stupor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. And then he says, souls in danger, look above 
Jesus completely said, not halfway, not three quarters of the way. He says, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, bellows his will obey. He your savior wants to be, be saved today. Hallelujah. Come on and put your hands together for the Lord. Hallelujah. If you've got a testimony of how the Lord rescued you from the seas of life, I want you to stand to your feet and give the Lord a praise all over the building. Come on, I didn't say if I did something for you. I said if you got a testimony of how the Lord rescued you, you ought to give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I know the Lord spoke to me because he saw what the enemy was putting it by way. And he saw me to the point where I was sinking, sinking so much that I began to get frustrated, sinking so much that I began to complain and began to speak what was contrary to the word of God, sinking so much till I was willing to step out and move out of position. And God said, stay focused. Stay focused. It's just a permanent, a temporary distraction. It's not permanent. It's just a temporary distraction. Tell your neighbor, it's just a temporary distraction. Stay focused. Stay in position. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Speak what he speaks. Say what his word says. Be what his word says you can be. Do what his word says you can do. Allow faith to lead you. Stay focused on God. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, stay focused on God. If that word really ministered to you today, and you believe that God was speaking to you, I want you to just raise your hand in the building. God says, stay focused. He says, don't worry what you're going through. He says, keep your eyes on me. He says, to run the race with patience. And he just didn't say run the, way, the race with patience. He said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Stay focused. Let's bow our heads. Fathers, we come before your presence. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you loved us so much. That you saw the direction in which we were heading. And you spoke to us. You pulled us back on the right track. Father, I pray, oh God, that you would give us the strength to stay focused and to keep our eyes on you. Father, because we realize if we take our eyes of you, we would sink 
in the sea of life. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God, for strengthening us to run this race with patience, looking unto Jesus Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And Father, we present those that may have needs today. Whatever the need is, we thank you, Lord God, that you know all about them. We thank you, Lord God, for supplying every need. And we thank you for working in the midst of every difficult situation. For we know with God, nothing is impossible. All things are possible with you. So, Father, we thank you for working on your people's behalf. And we thank you, Lord God, for the spirit of encouragement that they would continue to run this race with patience, with their eyes focused on you. And I don't want to end this altar call without giving someone the opportunity to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. If you're here today and you've not entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and you want to do so today, I want you to raise your hand. I see that hand of the gentleman sitting down. And I believe that God has already saved him. And I want God to give him the assurance to know that he is already saved. You may be watching us virtually. And you've not entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you want to do so today. So I want you to bow your heads right where you are. In your home. And repeat the words of this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father. Your word says all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. There is none good. Your word said the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And Father, I want to receive that eternal life. That life that is only found in your son, Jesus Christ. For your word says, he who had the son had life. And he who does not have the Son, does not have life. And Father, I want that eternal life. God, you said in your word, if I would confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. So Father, even now, right where I am, I confess that Jesus is Lord and you have raised him from the dead. And Father, I thank you that through faith, Jesus is now in my heart and I'm now a child of the King. Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit, the one that would lead me into all truth the one that will guide me in your word Father God strengthen me and help me to grow in grace in Jesus name I pray Amen Today it has been a privilege and a pleasure to have served as your host we at the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church are grateful that you are here worshipping with us today and as we leave we just wish God's richest blessings on you. I am Pastor Theophilus Claridge, pastor of the Children's Ministry of the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, and it has been my privilege and pleasure to serve as your host for today.